Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Republic of the Philippines, His Excellency Ferdinand R. Marcos Jr. We may now be seated to to formally begin our program. May we call on the Foreign Correspondents Association of the Philippines FOCA President, Ms. Gurley Linao, to deliver her welcome remarks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here with us today. Uh, welcome to the FOCAP 50th Anniversary Presidential Forum. The last time we held a presidential forum was almost a decade ago in 2015. So we're very excited to revive this journalistic tradition this year when FOCAP is celebrating its 50th founding anniversary. This annual event began when the late President Ferdinand Edralin Marcos met with the association on June 3, 1977. That was three years after FOCAP was established in 1974. A copy of the then President's speech can still be found in the official Gazette today. We thank you, Mr. President, for accepting our invitation and upholding this important tradition of engaging with FOCAP members. At the time of this information and misinformation, the ability of the press, including the foreign media, to directly hear from the highest official of the land and to ask questions on various topics, especially foreign policy and national governance, is crucial in keeping the public and the world informed. We hope that this will be the start of an annual event during your presidency, sir. Again, thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Linao. And now may we call on retired Chief Justice and Executive Secretary Lucas Bersamin to introduce our guest of honor and keynote speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Republic of the Philippines, His Excellency Ferdinand R. Marcos, Jr. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Secretary uh, Luke Bersamin, for your introduction. The, uh, please, sir, please be seated. The uh, Excellencies of the uh, Diplomatic Corps, uh, the Foreign Correspondents Association, or FOCAP, uh, President Gurley Linao, officers and members of Foreign Correspondents Association of the Philippines, my fellow workers in government who are here with us this afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good afternoon. This luncheon is a, uh, I would say, very profound moment for me on a personal and on an official level. Your first guest to this luncheon was my father 50 years ago. Five decades later, I stand here and I address you as president to celebrate the golden anniversary and carry on the legacy of this important media tradition. As president, I will seek this forum not only to explain our, pol our policies, but to renew my vow to what I deeply believe in, that the president's role is to defend press freedom and not lead in destroying it or demeaning its practitioners. It is my duty for which I ask no special favor, 
but only fairness, which every citizen, be he the leader of the land or a tiller of the soil, deserves from the fourth estate. Unlike many of my predecessors, I do not seek collaboration, for that implies a surrender of your independence. I am of the opinion that national interest is better served by a press that is critical rather than a press that is cooperative. It must have the untrammeled freedom to do its work, not just to arm the citizenry with the truth, but also to deepen discernment in this age of mass disinformation. In fact, this has been the hallmark of FOCAP's relationship with the presidency and the government for this last half century. Not compromising your principles has allowed you to live up to the public trust in a manner that is fair, but nuanced, balanced, but critical. The principal role of the press is not to applaud those who govern, but you hold us accountable without holding back and giving praise to those who deserve it and providing criticism for those who deserve that. Along with the stance is our collective goal of protecting the welfare and lives of journalists. This administration remains committed to bringing justice to the members of the press who were slain in the line of their noble duty. Rest assured that this government, through the Presidential Task Force and Media Security, is always on top of ensuring a safe environment for media practitioners in the country. It is in this spirit that I come here today to render a candid report and exchange ideas on matters that affect the country. I stated at the start of my administration that we would not yield one inch of territory to any foreign power. In recent years, the Philippines has been at the receiving end of illegal, aggressive, and irresponsible actions in the West Philippine Sea. It is crucial that the media, including the members of FOCA, to continue to expose these actions that not only threaten the peace and stability of the region, but also undermine the rules-based order that has underpinned global development and prosperity over the previous century. We must do everything to defend our sovereignty, exercise our sovereign rights and jurisdiction, and uphold our national interests. We also continue to seek and strengthen mutual partnerships with like-minded neighbors, friends, and allies to promote peace and ensure stability in the region. Having said that, the rule of law and global consensus are our greatest tools in securing our maritime territory. So while our nation faces its own trials, we remain deeply concerned about the ongoing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. And despite the geographical distance, our country is not spared from the impacts and shocks that the, com that the conflict uh, provides as we continue to experience food and energy insecurity along with the challenges in the global supply chain and continuing rising inflation. We continue to hope for a comprehensive, just, and lasting peace in the region for the safety and security of affected families, some of whom are Filipino. Allow me also to reiterate that the International Criminal Court has no jurisdiction over the Philippines as we remain to have a working judicial system and law enforcement mechanisms. This administration's concept of the anti-illegal drugs campaign has also been transformed as we are focusing more on prevention and rehabilitation. Under the, ban under the banner of Bagong Pilipinas, we are steadfast in adhering to our shared mission of advancing the welfare of Filipinos and nurturing a truly free and safe environment for all journalists. Once again, congratulations. Happy Golden Jubilee FOCAP. Thank you very much. Mabuhay kayong lahat. Maraming maraming salamat. Mabuhay ang bagong Pilipinas. Thank you, Mr. President. May we request the President to kindly remain on stage for the open forum? And may we call on once again the FOCAP president, Ms. Gurley Linao, to join the president on stage.
Okay. Um, we are going to open the floor to uh, questions, uh, Mr. President uh, Gurley. Hi. Yeah, th that's better. Okay. Hi again, Mr. President Gurley. We are going to open the, the floor now to uh, questions from FOCAP members. Um, may I call on um, Mr. Ken Sasaki of Quero News. Ken? Uh, good afternoon. Good uh, afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Um, it's great honor to meet you in the DC last week and also here in Manila. Um, I wish to ask you about the historical triathlon summit. Uh, held in DC. And uh, uh, the joint vision statement uh, announced the establishment of trilateral maritime dialogue uh, to cope with, uh, um, to cope with uh, uh, um, response, sorry, collective response and coordination, to enhance coordination. Uh, what is this dialogue meant is it uh, to respond to the uh, illegal and dangerous actions in the West Philippine Sea? And uh, when and where and by who the first meeting will be held? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Yes, uh, I think it, it, it bears explanation. Um, first of all, uh, the uh, trilateral agreement, as I was explaining when I was in uh, Washington, D.C., was that it is, not, it is not a response to the immediate uh, uh, occurrences, incidents that are happening to us, with us, around us, uh, but really a continuing development and evolution of the relationship that we have always had with the United States and with Japan. And uh, in truth, it formalizes what the US and Japan and the Philippines have already been doing together. Now, of course, security and defense uh, are a great uh, part of that uh, trilateral agreement. But an even greater part of the trilateral agreement are the economic cooperations that are being, uh, that are being fostered by the trilateral agreement. The, we went uh, during the summit uh, with uh, uh, Prime Minister Kishida and uh, 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 President Joe Biden uh, we went in, into quite a bit of detail as to what those areas are, semiconductors, renewables, uh, the uh, 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 transfer of technology, uh, uh, green minerals, all of these things were, were, were spoken about. And that, that plays an essential part uh, of that trilateral agreement. So it is, uh, it is not directed at anyone or against anyone. Uh, it is merely a strengthening or a formalization and uh, institutionalizing, I suppose, the, uh, the relationship of, of, uh, of the United States, Japan, and, uh, and the Philippines. Now, uh, the, the security and defense uh, part of the trilateral agreement, of course, speaks of interoperability, speaks of joint uh, exercises, uh, which uh, seem to be uh, perfectly, which we have been doing, again, we have already been doing before, but we have now put it down on paper in a formal document as to what we plan and how, how that partnership will continue to evolve as time goes on. So uh, I, uh, when it comes to the security and defense aspect, <clears throat> I'm sorry, of the South China Sea, of the West Philippine Sea, really uh, what the aim of the trilateral agreement, and, but it's not only the United States, Japan, and the Philippines, it's very many other countries all around the, the region and even as far as EU, as far as North America, are, are, uh, uh, is, is really to maintain the freedom of navigation along the South China Sea, simply because it is a recognition that the world right now is still having to recover from the pandemic economy, from the shocks that came from the Ukraine, uh, you, the, the war in Ukraine, and then now the Middle East. We just had a big escalation with Iran, Iran uh, attacking Israel. Uh, so there, there, the, the, these are these are the uh, these are the the elements that are that we are having to deal with. These are the shocks that are completely beyond our control. So uh, that. Uh, 
we, we have to maintain commerce, we have to maintain the peace, we have to maintain stability. And that's what really the point of the trilateral agreement is, is so that we provide for ourselves in the region, in the Indo-Pacific region, an area of peace and stability so that we can all, we can all find our way in this new global economy, post-pandemic economy. And I think that's really the point of uh, that trilateral agreement. Follow-up question, Ken? Thank you, President. Um, also, uh, this uh, statement uh, mentioned, as you, as you mentioned, that uh, about uh, HADR exercises, trilateral ones, uh, and uh, uh, that can be integrated in the maritime activities such as uh, Barikatan 2025. Uh, does it mean that the uh, Japanese Self-Defense Force uh, can be a regular member of this uh, Barikatan exercise? And how uh, and uh, uh, when uh, the first uh, HADR exercise would take place? Thank you. Well, uh, I, the, well Barikatan is traditionally between uh, the Philippines, which together with the Philippines and the U.S., uh, it is part of our mutual defense treaty that we hold these exercises every year. Now, with uh, the uh, um, uh, inclusion of Japan uh, into some of these exercises that we've been doing, not only Balikatan, but others, I, I don't see any, any reason why Japan should not be part of those exercises in the future. And uh, that, that, again, is, uh, uh, I think, is, 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 is a good... Uh, a move for us to, to make uh, simply because it will uh, uh, make it easier for us to work together and to coordinate together and again to, so that we can do the most, focus where the problems are, do maximize the resources that we have so that we can maintain the peace and stability and freedom of navigation and adhere co totally and completely and uh, constantly to the rule of international law, and specifically the UNCLOS. So the okay. thank you. can be trilateral next year. I cannot hear. I'm sorry? Uh, so the Barikatan can be trilateral exercise next year? Well, we'll see about that. I think you're not the first person to mention it. Um, and I think uh, that uh, that may be something that we can uh, we can study. So we'll let, let, let us just do this Barikatan now. It, the, the Barikatan exercise that we are uh, coming into now are the largest exercises that we have ever had. Uh, the most complex and it, it touches on uh, areas that we have never really had to deal with before, uh, specifically cyber security, uh, command and control, all of these things that we did not uh, before, we, that previously we had not uh, uh, included in our, in our coordinative efforts for Balikatan. So, uh, let's get through that, and then after that, we'll look again where, how the trilateral agreement has, uh, has uh, uh, allowed us to more options to include Japan, uh, and we'll see. And uh, I, 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 I don't, I, I, I for one have no objection to uh, such an idea. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you. May we have Mr. Um, uh, Noriyuki Sakai of NHK, please. Thank you for taking my questions, sure, President. Of course. So my question is regarding about the West Philippine Sea and also the, the Mutual Defense Treaty. Uh, despite the Yungin incident recently where some soldiers were injured, um, President, you said that there was there were no reason to invoke the, the Mutual Defense Treaty. So under what conditions would it possibly be invoked? I think Secretary Austin explained it very well. If any uh, serviceman, Filipino serviceman, is killed by an attack from any foreign power, then that is time to invoke the Mutual Defense Treaty. Uh, I, I was, I, I actually, when I, when I spoke to him in Washington, I thanked him for making it very, very clear to everyone. And he, 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 uh, he, uh, he, uh, he did precisely that. He, he, he was asked the same question that we are all asked, when do you invoke the Mutual Defense Treaty? When does it kick into action? And he said that if a, a Filipino serviceman is killed because of an attack or an aggressive action by another foreign power. I see, so um, just a follow up. Can, so the, the treaty be invoked against the, also the patrol vessels or the maritime militias 
rather than the, the military. Well, as long as they have actually uh, 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 caused casualties and has killed the servicemen, then that is that whether or whatever their designation are, whether they're merchant marine or or coast guard or actual uh, gray vessels or navy vessels, the, it does not matter. Uh, that is a, an attack on the Philippines by a foreign power. Thank you so Very much. The next question will be asked by Miss. Alison Jackson of the uh, Jean France Press. Okay. Hello, Mr. President. <coughs> Excuse me. Does the Philippines have a uh, plan to give the U.S. military access to more Philippine bases as part of EDCA, such as building one on Batanas? And are you concerned that such a move could provoke? even stronger actions. Sorry. Sorry, could you hear me, sir? I can, yes. You can, okay. Um, let me just start again. Does the Philippines plan yes. to give the US military access let, let to Let me more stop you right there. The answer to that is no. The okay. Philippines has no plan to create any more bases or give access to any more bases. So, yes. So, okay. if but yes. if there's anything else you'd like yes. to ask, um, I, I'm, just, I'm happy given to Given that we, they've been granted access to nine bases so far, are you concerned that um, this is part of what is, this could be provoking the strong actions by China in the South China Sea, or do you actually consider these sites as protection in case of a conflict between the US and China? No, I think that's turning the situation on its head. These are reactions to what has happened in the South China Sea, to the aggressive actions that we have had to deal with the, uh, uh, the water cannoning, the uh, lasers, the collision, the blockade, blocking of our banca, our fishermen, the putting of barriers across uh, uh, Scarborough Shoal. This is a reaction to that. Uh, this did not cause that. That happened before we had EDCA. And just to clarify, that's a categorical no to more EDCA bases. No. Definitely, no, 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 no. The Philippines has no plans to, um, uh, uh, to open or to establish uh, more EDCA bases. Uh, okay, as my uh, follow-up question, um, are you concerned that a Donald Trump administration would not offer the same ironclad commitment to the Philippines that the Biden administration has repeatedly made as recently as last week? And what impact would that have on the Philippines' strategy of pushing back against Chinese actions in the South China Sea, such as publicizing incidents? Well, I, I, I think it, it would be artful to say that we do not watch uh, uh, closely uh, the uh, political cycle that is ongoing in the United States. Because inevitably, if there is a change in government, if, if uh, President Biden is reelected, then uh, uh, we have a fairly uh, solid ground to base or our, our positions on because we have already spoken with him. And in, but inevitably, if there is a change in government, then there will be changes in policy. Uh, we do not know what those are. Uh, but I believe that uh, what, we, uh, what we have agreed with the United States are beyond politics. And uh, I, I think that they are, since they, are, they almost rise to treaty uh, agreements, uh, those treaty agreements must be honored, and that, I think, uh, puts us on, on, on good ground. But uh, I will not deny that we, 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 uh, we look, certainly, we examine who's, who's going to be in charge, who's going to, in case uh, uh, the former president, be, is, former President Trump is reelected, what will be the changes that will affect us? Uh, it, it's hard to say. It's all speculation for now. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank um, you. May we have um, Ms. Raisa Robles of the uh, South China Morning Post. Good afternoon. Good afternoon sir. Uh, this is concerning the Arelma case involving ill-gotten wealth of your family of at least $40 million in bearer bonds oh. invested by the Panamanian Corporation Arelma in Merrill Lynch in New York. Okay. The Philippine government petitioned to get it back, but you filed a petition in 2009 in New York, also later before the Supreme Court here, to stop it. According to the World Bank, it is still pending 
Now that you are the president representing the Philippine government with the Solicitor General and the PCGG under you, which side will you represent, Mr. President? Will you fight yourself so that the Philippine government that you now represent can finally get it for the Filipino people? Well, you know, it's hard for me to answer. You clearly know more about the case than I do. Uh, I, I, I really haven't looked at it uh, in years. And I would advise you to talk to the lawyers that are handling it because I, I, I'm, not, I'm not being specious or anything like that. Matagal ko nang hindi narinig yung pangalan na Arelma. That was, we were still in Hawaii when we were hearing that name. So we haven't really been uh, attending to it. I, the, the, the cases, the cases, the previous cases, the uh, uh, cases that were filed post-1986, I have not touched. I have nothing, I, 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 it, it would be highly improper for me to involve myself in that. Uh, besides, I don't have the time to do it, so I leave it to the lawyers. Follow-up question, please. Okay. The Philippine government is already compensating martial law, human rights victims, under your father's rule. Why have you resisted issuing an apology for atrocities committed during martial law under your father's rule? And will you continue doing so as the president? Well, I don't think it is a duty for a president to be involved. It, that is a personal matter for the Marcos family. But you uh, are a member of the Marcos family. I, definitely, but it's more, my role as president is more important right now than my role as a member of the Marcos family. So I take that, that's my first priority. So will you, will you apologize as president of the republic in behalf? What? The president of the, of the no, that, 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 seems, uh, that seems highly, uh, a, a little contrived, no? Uh, who is apologizing to whom now? Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Raisa. May we have um, uh, Ms. Karen Lemma of Reuters, please? Good afternoon, Mr. President. Uh, thank you once again for being with us today. Um, thank you. Mr. President, um, your government has been saying that this is related to the South China Sea, my question, particularly on oil and gas exploration. Um, your government has said that it was prepared to guarantee, and I quote, unimpeded and peaceful exploration of all natural resources within the EEZ and other areas where we have jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. May I ask, how does your government plan to accomplish that, and what will that entail? Ah, that's a fairly sensitive question because we, there, there's, there are, there are, let me categorize uh, those areas for, that are ripe or that, that, that we are looking at for exploration. Uh, there are those who are in non-conflict areas. That's what we defined, that's what we term them as now, the conflict areas and non-conflict areas. And as far as, as far as the Philippines is concerned, if those uh, uh, prospective reserves are within the EEZ, conflict area or otherwise, then any exploration should be conducted by the Philippines. Uh, so if that, however we choose to do it, if we choose to do it by ourselves, if we choose to do it in partnership with uh, other corporations, or we, uh, which we probably uh, will be the case because uh, we, 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 don't have, we don't have the capacity for that very large scale heavy engineering in terms of exploration. But how that's going to be done? Uh, because in, in, in our case in the Philippines, it is really a, not a matter of choice. Let me take it back a, a couple of steps. Uh, in the Philippines, we are presently trying to shift our uh, mix of power generation from fossil fuels away, away from fossil fuels towards renewables. Now, that doesn't happen in an instant. You do not flick a switch and you are suddenly all renewable. You have a transition period, which is, is turning out to be much more complicated than everyone thought. But anyway, in the Philippines, we have decided that LNG is going to be our transition fuel. 
And that is why it is imperative for the Philippines to now examine and to see to a guarantee the supply of LNG to our country so that we have sufficient uh, power. Because it's not enough that we maintain the levels of power generation that we have now. But with all the plans that we have, essentially to industrialize the Philippines, uh, it's essentially to enter into the digital space, all of these things require a great deal of power. And so it's, uh, it, it, it is important to the Philippines that we explore those reserves and see exactly what there are and how we go about how we both how we go about exploiting them and bringing that uh, gas supply to the Philippines. So uh, we are, are doing our best. I think we will, of course, to be to keep it uh, to keep it simple. You, we, I think the 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 uh, uh, prevailing term these days is, is is pick the low hanging fruit. So the low hanging fruit will those will those be will those will those will be those reserves that are within our EEZ, that are, in, that are not in a conflict area. Uunahin not we'll, go, we'll uh, attend to that first. And then we'll see what else that we can do. We need them all, though. We need them all. Even if we do well with the non-conflict areas uh, reserves, we still have to look at all the others, whether they be in conflict areas or otherwise. Follow up, please. Just a follow-up, uh, Mr. President. Very quick. Um, has progress been made on the oil and gas talks between the Philippines and China. Last year, if I'm not mistaken, both countries have agreed to resume oil and gas talks. So has progress been made? If yes, why? And if no, then why not? Well, it always, we, always, we always come up against the same um, argument or between, the, between uh, uh, China and the Philippines. Because when we say that we would like to explore uh, they insist that these areas are in Chinese territory, and therefore Chinese law must prevail. We, of course, do not accept that. We say this is Philippine territory, and therefore Philippine law should prevail. That's really where the sticking point is. Uh, uh, since you, even before I came into office, that was already the situation we've been. Uh, I, I hear a great many optimistic uh, reports. Uh, that uh, they're saying that uh, they, we have agreed, there's, we've come to an agreement, but I, I haven't really seen um, something that we can work, that we, that we can use to work forward. Uh, in other words, uh, I don't really think we have a proper agreement, and it really comes down to that issue, which law will apply. And the reason that there is an argument is that China claims that these uh, territories belong to China. We dispute that, and that's where the problem is. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Uh, may we have Ms. Uh, Joanna Balearan of GG Press, please. Good afternoon, Mr. President. I'm Joanna Balearan from GG Press. So my question is about Japan and the Reciprocal Access Agreement. So um, when will the Philippines and Japan sign the agreement? And can you please give us a time frame? For? For the RAA, sir. For the? RAA. The reciprocal yes. access agreement with Japan. Ah, the reciprocal. Ah, yeah, we're we're, we're working on that. Yes, yes, we are. We we. That, malapit na, that, sorry, uh, that will be coming soon. Um, we spoke about it again in with uh, Prime Minister Kishida when I was in Washington. There aren't any real uh, conflicts in principle. It's just a question a question of getting the language down and defining precisely how it's going to work, the logistical systems and how that's going to work. But it should not take very much longer. I, I think uh, uh, we're very close to completion on that. Okay, sir. Uh, just a follow-up. Sure. Are Filipino comfort women who are still seeking um, World War II justice and reparations uh, are raising concerns about the RAA. Um, how do you ensure that this agreement doesn't compromise um, the country's interest, and uh, which country do you think should take custody of Japanese soldiers committing crime on Philippine soil? I cannot see how the reciprocal agreement would affect uh, any of that. Uh, it is entirely, it, it essentially talks about uh, that we, the, we, they, we the Japan allows us to, um, to make ports of call uh, in Japan and vice versa. Um, how it will possibly affect 
the uh, issue about comfort women uh, and the what what allegations that are made against war criminals during the Second World War. Uh, I cannot see how how it will it will it will bleed into that. It, I think it's quite distinct and discreet uh, in its in its effect. About the custody, Thank sir. About the yeah. custody of the custody of erring Japanese uh, servicemen uh, in on Philippine soil. Which country do you think should um, take custody of these Japanese servicemen in case RAA is um, approved? Oh. <laughs> it's not. It's not the same as a visiting forces agreement. Uh, that I think is. That's not. That's not. Uh, uh, it's not similar. The vis visiting for We've had problems with that with the Americans. Uh, America. Some some American forces, as we all know. Uh, but uh, that's not. Sim it, it's very very different from uh, what the uh, 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 reciprocal agreement will be with the Japanese. It's not going to be as if it's their base and they, the people, the, their, 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 uh, uh, their seamen will come down and will go into the city and go into. Well, I don't think that that's a part of the uh, agreement. Thank, Thank you, you so much. May Thank we you. have uh, Mara Cepeda of the Straits Times, please? Hello, Mr. President. Hello. Sir, you already reiterated the position of the Philippines regarding the ICC. Yes. And so, sir, I raised the issue of the Philippines advocating for an international rules-based order. We're pushing for it when we are uh, resisting Beijing's uh, aggressive actions against the Philippines in the West Philippine Sea. But we are opting out of the Rome Statute when an adverse, adverse, adverse case has been lodged against us. So, sir... Is the rules-based order only applicable to the Philippines when it's convenient for what us? Is, what is the rule about the ICC? When do they when do they adopt jurisdiction? They adopt jurisdiction in a country, or they 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 have jurisdiction in a country when no judicial system is working, is is uh, is, is is functioning, no police uh, or are uh, 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 are no police force is functioning. In other words, that probably there is war. And none of these uh, issues about um, uh, about war crimes and all of this are being attended to simply because the administration, especially in the judiciary, especially in law enforcement, are not functioning. That is the reason why we are saying we are well within the rules. It is their rule. It is the rule of ICC that they come in when there is no judiciary. They come in when there is no police force. We have, we have a judiciary, the chief justice, the former chief justice sitting right here. He will explain to you how healthy and robust and uh, uh, health, how, how, how uh, active the judiciary is. The police force, I think, is the same thing. So that is the reason. It is not, it, it, we are well within, we are well within international law when we take the position when, of not recognizing the jurisdiction of ICC in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. One follow-up, sir. So yeah. if, if the ICC issues an arrest warrant against former President Duterte, will the Philippine government hand him over? Will we do what? Will the Philippine government hand him over if the ICC We issues don't recognize the warrant that they will send to us. So that's a no? That's a no. Thank you, sir. Uh, Regine Cabata of the Washington Post, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mr. President. Last week, you said that you were horrified at the prospect of a gentleman's agreement between former President would Duterte that, and would China. That, wouldn't you be? <laughs> of course. I think we all should, right? Mm -hmm. And you said as well, Mr. President, that he should be held accountable. Um, and since then, um, experts have said that any such agreement compromising PH sovereignty or territory would be a violation of not just the 2016 arbitral ruling, um, but Philippine law. Um, so my question for you, sir, is how do you intend to hold former President Duterte accountable? Are there any actions being taken on this front? Well, we're, we're well <laughs> we still have to find out what it is all about. We cannot, I, I, I've, I've talked to, I've talked, I've tried to be in, get, get in touch with former officials of the previous administration who could possibly have been involved uh, in these discussions. And uh, I have to tell you, I haven't gotten a straight answer out of anyone. Now, 
one party says one one person says there's no agreement another person says uh, no there was talk but it's only status quo no there was and another one will say there was an agreement so i'll go back to the three questions that i asked when this came, when this subject came up number one the first question i i want to i want answered is was there an agreement in fact i think by now we can see that in fact there was a secret agreement and the, what verifies that, and what 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 uh, uh, what I think for me at least convinces me that there was in fact a secret agreement, is the insistence of the Chinese government that there was a secret agreement. I do not think the Chinese government. I don't think Beijing will just make up and so just out of nowhere say there was a secret agreement when there was no such thing. All right. So I think, in my, to my mind, that that is sufficient to me to prove to me that there was such an agreement. The second question I need answered is, what is contained in that secret agreement? What did we agree to? And why did we agree to them, to that? Uh, what exactly is it, is it that we compromised? Number two. Number three, and this is a critical question, why did you keep it secret? Why is, that not, why is there not one single document that contains that agreement? Why is there not one shred of evidence that can show that this agreement exists? Why when we, the, tr the transition period between the previous administration to this administration, did no one mention a secret agreement? Why was it kept secret? That's, uh, that, 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 these are very simple questions, but I find, I'm finding a great deal of difficulty finding answers for them. Because I hear one thing and another thing and another thing and another thing. It's all, it's all very, maraming uh, palusot. Um, in other words, I don't know how to translate that in English, but maraming palusot. Let me add um, a fourth question to that, Mr. President. What happens if you find out that there might be a legal liability um, on the part of former President I cannot Duterte. see how there could possibly be a legal liability. There is no evidence of any agreement. Okay. Um, another I, 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 what, yes. what, 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 what did we, what, is there a document that is signed? I'd love to see it. Mm -hmm. You know, some, uh, it, 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 it does not affect the Philippines. And if there is, I, I have said that before, when this first came up a few months ago, and they said, they said, it turns out that the Chinese are insisting that there's a secret agreement, and perhaps there is. And I said, I, didn't, I don't know anything about the secret agreement. Should there be such a secret agreement, I am now rescinding it. So I've rescinded it, if indeed it exists. It's, we are so far from getting to the truth, to the nub of the thing. We are so far away from it yet that it's very hard to give a reaction to, that, to, to those questions. Let's get those three questions answered. We've answered the first one. Now, what is, what is contained in that secret agreement and why was it kept secret? Those are the two uh, questions left. Once we get those three answers, no, uh, real answers, then we will know what to do. Just a quick follow-up, Mr. President. You also said last week that you found um, the silence of Vice President Sara Duterte understandable even as her family members have attacked you lately. And some analysts have even said that the family is out to undermine your policy. How would you describe your relationship with the Duterte family currently? And how would you reconcile your continued allyship with the vice president and her family's vocal disdain for your policy? It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <laughs> Right. It's complicated, but if you ask about the, uh, the, the, the one, of course, that I have the most, uh, the most uh, contact with is uh, in Daisara. And it, how we were with each other during the campaign, after the election, after, no, it hasn't really changed. You um, know, that's what she always says. She said, well, are you all right now? You were in the middle of all of this. And she says, no, I'll just work. Don't, I, I don't worry about it. I'll just work and work and work and work. That's our attitude. All right. Thank you Thank so you. much for answering very candidly, Mr. President. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. President. Okay. At this point, may we request the President um, to please proceed downstage and grant us a group.
photo with all of our attendees. Like, likewise, may we request our attendees to gather at the center and join us with a group photo. Thank you so much, Mr. President, for granting us a photo opportunity. That concludes our program. Thank you, Mr. President, for gracing the event today.